I'm frequently asked, what is the best way to become a better cook? My answer is always the same. Becoming a better cook isn't about learning one big skill. Rather, it's about incorporating tons of small individual skills over time. And today I'm sharing with you 10 tiny changes that will dramatically improve your cooking. These don't require a ton of time, effort, or money, but they will make you a significantly better home cook. Let's start off by talking about something really, really tiny, like salt. The salt you use and how you use it during cooking can make a big difference. The first thing I'll say is to stop using table salt in your cooking. This stuff is heavily processed and as a result, it has this chemically aftertaste. It's a little tinny and metallic. Plus it is really, really salty and it has no nuance and flavor. And as a result, it's really easy to over salt your food. What I recommend you do instead is to primarily rely on kosher salt in your cooking. That's what most restaurant chefs do as well so you're in good company. I really like using diamond crystal kosher salt in my cooking because it's got this light flaky coarse texture that dissolves easily. It's also really easy to pinch and it's about half as salty as table salt, tablespoon for tablespoon. As a result, you have a lot more control over how much salt you're adding to your food and you're a lot less likely to oversalt your food with this stuff than with this. I also like to keep some sea salt on hand, but it is pretty pricey. This is like seven or $8. So I like to reserve it for a few things. I primarily use sea salt when I'm finishing a dish where that nice sea salt flavor is going to come in handy or in a raw dish where the uncooked flavor of the food is really important and you want to bring it out or in desserts because the fine texture really distributes evenly in the batter. Now that you know what type of salt to use in your cooking, don't be stingy with it. Salt is what makes food taste like food. It unlocks certain flavor compounds and aromas in our food that would otherwise lie dormant. And if you're worried about sodium, what I'll say is that the overwhelming majority of sodium in our diets, at least here in the States, comes from processed foods and eating out, not from cooking with salt at home. If you're cooking primarily plant-based foods at home, which is what I advocate, don't really have to worry about adding salt to your food. The last thing I'll say about salt is like any other seasoning, make sure you're adding it throughout various stages of the cooking process, not just at the end. More on this tip in a bit. I often hear people say things like, I'm just not a fan of vegetables, or I hate tomatoes, or I hate zucchini. And when I hear that, I think you probably just haven't had the best version of that vegetable. If your only experience with tomatoes are these sad, mushy, watery, soggy things from the supermarket, really missing out on all that tomatoes can offer. What I recommend instead is to buy your tomatoes and as many fruits and vegetables as you can in season and at a local farmer's market if you have one. By incorporating more seasonal produce into your cooking and shopping at the farmer's market when you can can, you're going to automatically improve your cooking without having to do anything differently in the kitchen. That's because the fruits and vegetables you're preparing and cooking are going to be sweeter, fresher, riper, and more flavorful. If for instance, you make my mushroom stroganoff with white button mushrooms from the grocery store, it's still going to be good. But if you can throw in a few wild mushrooms from the farmer's market, it is going to be incredible. Or if you make my pesto, it's going to be good any time of year. But if you make it with basil that's in season in the summer, it's going to be outrageously good. Speaking of basil, that brings me to my next tip. If you want to add unique flavor, dimension, and character to your cooking, you got to start incorporating more fresh herbs. Dried herbs are certainly convenient but they can't deliver what fresh herbs do in terms of nuanced flavor, freshness, and texture. Here are some of my favorite ways to incorporate fresh herbs into your cooking. I love adding fresh herbs to salads for complexity and interest, both in terms of flavor and texture. This is best done with soft herbs, so parsley, cilantro, mint, basil, dill, chives, tarragon, and you can use some whole pieces of herbs. You can tear them up or you can chop them for different levels of texture. Another thing you can do is to make a bouquet garni. That's just a fancy French word for a bundle of herbs tied together. This is best done with sturdier herbs. So thyme, sage, oregano, rosemary, and this is going to infuse a lot of depth of flavor into soups, stews, or even if you're just cooking a pot of beans or lentils. I also recommend finishing your cooked dishes with some herbs for fresh and unique flavors. And I don't just mean adding some chopped parsley as a colorful garnish. So if you're making a Southeast Asian dish, maybe like a Thai curry or a Vietnamese noodle soup, some Thai basil is gonna go a long way. If you're making an Indian dish or a Mexican dish, cilantro at the end is a great addition. And if you're making my mushroom stroganoff, you'll notice that I add dill at the end. It imparts a grassy, unique flavor that really takes the stroganoff to another level. Another great thing you can do with fresh herbs is to make an herby condiment like gremolata, which is gonna add a lot of brightness and zing to your cooking. So classically, it's just made with parsley, garlic, and lemon zest, but sometimes I also 
lead basil, and you can also experiment with the flavor, so swapping cilantro for parsley and lime zest for lemon zest. And if you're worried about fresh herbs going bad and not being able to use them up, try adding some fresh herbs to whatever sauce or condiment you're making, or making a sauce entirely out of the herbs, such as pesto. And for sturdy herbs, you can freeze them in ice cube trays with olive oil, and then you have herbed oil at the ready. If you've ever made a dish that fell flat or felt like it was missing something, you probably didn't add any acid. No, not that kind of acid, this kind of acid. An acidic ingredient can draw out other flavors in your dish and unlock different dimensions. There's something else in here. The most common acidic ingredients that you're most likely familiar with lemons and limes, but there are so many other options. Like vinegars, from red and white vinegar to sherry, balsamic, and rice vinegar. Also wine, both red and white. Tomatoes, from whole tomatoes, which are a little bit less acidic, to canned tomatoes, tomato paste, and tomato sauce. And there's so many other plant-based sources of acid, including creamy things like vegan yogurt and sour cream and mayo, other condiments like hot sauces and mustards, ferments and pickled vegetables like sauerkraut or vegan kimchi, certain baking ingredients ingredients like molasses and natural cocoa powder, and several ingredients that are common in global cuisines like preserved lemons, sumac, black limes, and Indian pickles. A lot of what I've learned about using acids to leverage other flavors comes from this fantastic cookbook from Samin Nosrat. I promise if you read this book, you will become a better cook. I like using acidic ingredients to brighten up heavy, rich, creamy dishes. That's why I add Dijon mustard to the end of this creamy, rich stroganoff. It adds a perky tang. I also add a little bit of dry mustard powder to my creamy vegan cheese sauce for the same reason. Acids also help to balance other flavors and produce well-rounded dishes, like spicy flavors. This is why you'll often see Indian dishes served with yogurt on top. It's an acid that helps to cool all the spiciness. This is why I finish my dishes like chana masala and red lentil curry with some lemon juice and my chili with some lime juice. And sweet flavors. Acid is what makes lemon cakes and lemon bars so irresistibly good, that balance of the tart tanginess and the sweetness. You'll also find this balance in the savory side of cooking. Sweet and sour sauces common in Chinese cuisine are a great example, as is nook jum, a Vietnamese dipping sauce that's sour, sweet, and savory. You can also use acids to balance bitter flavors in your cooking, which I know many of us do not like. That's why I love to use citrusy lemony dressings with a kind of peppery bitter leaf like a arugula or radicchio when I'm making a salad. And this is why in baking, I love pairing coffee with chocolate because coffee is acidic, dark chocolate is bitter. And when you combine the two with sugar, with the sweetness, you get magic. If you're using some lemons or limes in your cooking to bring acid, you might also want to add some of the zest. You're gonna get more concentrated citrus flavor when you use the zest instead of just the juice because the natural oils of the citrus fruit live in the peel. And because the peel doesn't have that potent acidity, it actually has more pure citrus flavor that's milder and a little bit floral. And the zest works not just for lemons and limes, but other citrus fruits like oranges and grapefruits. When you introduce citrus zest into your dishes, you're going to get a lot of complex flavors. For instance, in my recent hummus video, I showed you how to top the hummus with lightly fried lemon peel. That adds a really unique dimension that will delight your taste buds. You can also try finishing roasted vegetables with a bit of lemon zest and lemon juice to perk them up and give them some pizzazz. Lemon zest is also a great way to bring some brightness and zippiness to a creamy pasta dish. And it's also great in several kinds of desserts. That's why lemon desserts made with lemon zest and not just the juice are so much more lemony and zingy in flavor. Orange zest is also fantastic in sweet foods and enhances the flavors already present. I love adding orange zest to desserts like cakes as well as breakfast foods like oatmeal, granola, and French toast. Citrus zest can also really enliven your salad dressings and sauces. If I'm making a sauce or marinade for tofu that uses lime juice, I might also add some lime zest. And if I have some grapefruit on hand, I might also zest that into a salad dressing. Or you can use zest to make gremolata, which I talked about in an earlier tip. If you're cooking a complicated recipe, something you've never made before, or baking, it really helps to invest in some precision. There are lots of fancy precision tools and kitchen gadgets out there, but if you can spring for just two, I recommend a digital scale and an oven thermometer. I swear by one of these in all of my recipes and cooking, you can get really precise down to the gram, so it is really helpful in baking, plus you don't have to dirty all of those measuring cups. 
Also oven thermometer, like five to $10 and super important because most home ovens are not properly calibrated. For example, at one of my old apartments, the oven would say it was at 400 degrees, but usually it was actually closer to 450 to 475 in the oven. So I would often burn my food, whether it was a baked good or roasted vegetable. Of course, you should also use your senses when it comes to cooking. So if you're roasting potatoes in the oven, for instance, and you notice that halfway through they're browning pretty quickly, go ahead and lower the oven temperature. That's where common sense comes into play because cooking, yes, is part science, but it's also part common sense. Many of us have a fixed mindset when it comes to cooking. We believe that our abilities are static. They're givens that we can't really meaningfully change. This is how I used to think about my own career. I used to be a lawyer. I was really rational, analytical, and I thought there's no way I could ever be creative or work in a creative field. In contrast, people with a growth mindset believe that they can improve their skills with effort and persistence. So in the kitchen, a growth mindset would involve trying out new recipes and techniques, getting out of your comfort zone, and forgiving your yourself for mistakes along the way. It's not good at all. No one learns how to become a great cook overnight. It takes time and repeated failures. That's why you'll often find me sharing on my Instagram stories when a recipe doesn't work out because those failures make me a better cook. Learning how to incorporate spices into your cooking is gonna make your food taste better, but if you wanna take it to the next level, I recommend experimenting with grinding your own whole spices. Now, this isn't something I do every day or with every recipe, but when I do, it definitely makes a difference. Spices start to release their aromas as soon as they're ground, so the pre-ground stuff starts to lose its potency pretty quickly. In contrast, a whole spice has a protective seed coating, so the aroma, the flavor, doesn't get released until it's ground or heated up. And the result is a flavor that's richer, more complex, and more aromatic. Depending on the recipe you're making, you can toast your whole spices as is, or you can grind them up before toasting them. There are two main ways to grind spices, a mortar and pestle, or a spice grinder. This little thing has really transformed my cooking. Sounds like a lot of extra work, but really only takes a couple extra minutes. If you're wondering what kind of recipes should I be using whole spices in, I think the obvious answer is Indian food. That's the cuisine most associated with whole spices, but there are lots of other ways to incorporate them into your cooking. I like to use whole spices to jazz up simple meals like this lentil salad. It's made with really simple, wholesome ingredients, but the spiced oil is what really takes it over the top. Or the seed sprinkle, which is a great all-purpose condiment. It features warm and toasty lemony coriander seeds that really make it shine. And when it comes to baking, especially those fall flavored desserts, using freshly grated nutmeg is gonna make a world of a difference. My next tip is to layer flavors at various stages in the cooking process. To show you what I mean, let's visit my lentil shepherd's pie. I start this lentil filling off by sauteing some onions in olive oil. I also add salt to this because it helps to cook the onions down with a nicer, deeper, browner flavor. Next comes another layer of flavor by cooking down garlic, which takes it from pungent and raw to slightly sweet. I also add some fresh thyme and rosemary at this stage for some earthy, woodsy, lemony, piney flavors that accent the lentil. Now we have tomato paste, and instead of just plopping it in with the liquid, I cook it down for a few minutes, which unlocks its true potential. It gets sweeter and becomes a more potent source of umami. Next, I deglaze with some red wine. It brings a depth of flavor and rich body that intensifies the meatiness of the lentils. Now I finally add the lentils, and I cook them in vegetable broth instead of water to add a little more flavor and also add some bay leaves. You could leave the lentils as they are and just season with salt and pepper, but I take them over the top by adding tahini, it adds a nutty creaminess, tamari or soy sauce for another source of umami, and balsamic vinegar, a source of acid that brings a nice sweetness and tang. Now finally, some salt and pepper for that final layer. This tip might be my easiest tip of all. You can become a significantly better cook by just tasting as you go. For instance, with that shepherd's pie lentil filling, as soon as the lentils were cooked, I gave them a taste to have a baseline. Then I added the tamari, tahini, and vinegar, and if this were my first time making the recipe, I'd probably add just half the amount, taste, and then add more. One of the benefits of tasting as you go is that it gives you the ability to detect problems in the dish when they're still small. If you wait until the end to taste your dish for the first time though, the problem or problems might be too big to fix. By adopting this process, you'll get better and better over time at learning when a dish is lacking a certain flavor or element. All right, that's it for me. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.